we are going to stand to read the word in a moment, but this portion of scripture requires introduction. And so you can get ready by turning your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, and uh, we'll be in verses 14, 15, and 16. Uh, eventually, we'll be in verses 14, 15, and 16. We're looking at, now listen, we're looking at a, a little mini-series right here in this portion of Scripture. It's extremely uh, important, as you'll see in a moment. But the title of this, I don't mean to offend anybody, but you'll see where we're going to be going eventually on this. The title is No Pastor, Priest, Pope, or King. I'm actually going to ask you to write that down in your note-taking. And there's no paper right in front of the seat that's in front of you. No pastor, priest, pope, or king. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. And before we dive into those wonderful verses, I want to point out the fact that throughout the entire Bible church, that there's several encounters recorded in Scripture where God allows himself, the Lord allows himself to be experienced by mortal man in very, very unique ways. Now, you guys know, as students of the Bible, that the scripture says that we cannot look upon God and live. You know that? The Bible says that. Moses got the closest, if you think about it, when it comes to the rawness of the nature of God. Um, God, is, God is a spirit being. God is... Um, C.S. Lewis was the first one to crack open this statement that just really causes you uh, to pause and to almost, I think in a healthy way, step back, as it were, away from the presence of God for sheer awe. And it's C.S. Lewis that said, when you consider the person of God and his nature, you would be better to consider him as a mind rather than anything else. Now you think about that for a moment. I didn't say brain. There's a big difference. Brain weighs about eight and a half pounds. At least yours does. Mine's at about 6.2, I think. <laughs> the brain. The brain is this fleshy thing. Odd, strange, mysterious to this very moment apparatus that there's nothing like it in the known universe, by the way either in micro or in vast, deep space. Nothing compares, nothing. And yet the mind, where is the mind in relation to the brain? Is it, is it through the brain? Is it, is it around the brain? Is it, is it in the, the canals? Is it in the, we don't know. For those of you who are evolutionists, this is the big stumper, is you can say all you want about, you know, we, we, we eventually rubbed this irritation on our face and we got an eye and then we decided to do it on this side and got another eye and we, we changed in our feathers for flippers and then got hands, whatever your story is, you know. Here's the thing that just puts evolution dead in its track stop is the human consciousness. And the most fascinating thing is to, is to actually study the moments of death of a human being. Because what leaves them, which is fascinating if you think about it, what leaves them is their consciousness. Their bladder doesn't go anywhere. Their brain doesn't go anywhere. Listen, their, their stomach doesn't go anywhere. They're dead. Why are they dead? The physicalness of them stopped. But the ethereal part, the spiritual entity of who we are is in our consciousness. And there's no place where you can find that in the human body apart from the things of the spirit. We just need to stop long enough to ponder these things. It's fascinating, but think about it. I wrote down some names about those to whom God allowed special experiences with. So think about for a moment, if you know your Bible, Abraham. God spoke to Abraham. God, listen, Abraham heard God speak. I mean, I don't know about you, but that freaked me out. Can you imagine? What does his voice sound like? My question is, is his voice, I assume it is, but is his voice consistent? When he spoke to uh, Abraham, is it the same 
Is it the same voice that spoke to Moses or Samuel? Yes, good. Whoever. Isaiah. Is it the same? I'm assuming it is the same. He's, he's, he's a person. He has personality, which, by the way, that's why you're a person and you have personality, because you've been created in the image of God. Are you with me? So when you think about God, you think about not the physical structure, but God is spirit. And he's apart from all other claims of deities known to humanity. But when he spoke to Abraham, he allowed himself to be in the vicinity, as it were, of Abraham. And then, of course, Moses, as I mentioned earlier, God got so close to Moses. It's the cutest thing. In my opinion, it's awesome that Moses, Moses says, if I could see your glory, what a, what a prayer request. Can I see your glory? And God could have said, like he always said, nobody can look on me and live. Moses, if you see me, you'll, you'll fry your brains out. You'll be, you'll be vaporized. You know what God did? God worked out a problem. Of course, no problem to God. But God, the Bible says that God had Moses go into a crack of a rock. So where this big rock, there's a crack, and Moses goes inside this crack, and he's hiding like hide and seek. And how does this work? So imagine this is Moses right there. See, this is Moses. God goes like this. So here's the person of God. And the Bible tells us that, Moses, you can't see me and live, but I'll tell you what. I'll let you get as close to this experience as you possibly can. I will, let, I will let you see the atmosphere of where I just walked through. When I pass by, I will let you see my presence, the disturbance that my presence makes in the atmosphere where you live. The air that you breathe, you know, Moses? So you ready? So, okay. So here's the deal. And the Bible says that God put out his hand and covered Moses, and then God went by and then took his hand away, and Moses didn't see God, but he saw the atmosphere where God had just passed through. And it was so awesome that Moses' face had some form of physical transformation. Moses' face, because, you know, I, you know, I'm assuming he had his robe on and stuff, but it says that his face, um, well, I mean, he got a S-O-N, burn. <laughs> he got a sunburn. The Bible says that Moses' face illuminated. And so he put a covering over his head. You ever think of Moses with a head cut? He's look like Halloween. Moses comes, he's got a bag on his head. And he comes down the mountain so that the children of Israel would not see the glory of God's presence on Moses' face waning. Oh my gosh. Hello? Waning. He, when he was in God's presence, he was illuminated. And then by the time he got down to the mountain base, uh, he wasn't as shiny. <laughs> and there's a message in that for all of us. Stay close to God and shine in this world. Yeah. Right? Think about that. And, um, and so I think about that experience. I think about Joshua, Moses' assistant, Joshua. Uh, Joshua, the Bible tells us, and, and we'll read it here in a moment, Joshua encountered the Lord in a way that God often manifest, manifested himself to mankind. And uh, I'll point it out in a, in a moment in scripture. Do you guys remember Manoah? Who remembers Manoah? Remember he had a son. His son was a real pain. Manoah had a boy, and his name was Samson. He was one of the judges of Israel. And um, the Lord appears unto Manoah and his wife, the uh, future mom and dad of Samson, and the, uh, the Lord says, you're going to have a baby, and God gives the criteria about how to raise this kid and all. And it's cute, because Manoah turns to his wife and says... <laughs> He says, honey, God just appeared and said that he's going to do all this stuff. The problem is, we just, we just saw the Lord, we're going to die. <laughs> I mean, it's a totally conflicting story, but that's how he interpreted it is. 
God wants to do something with us, but we just saw God, so we're going to die. Just sit down and die. <laughs> but God had a plan. In fact, she, you know, leave it up to her. She, she basically uh, lets him know, I don't think God's going to kill us if he's got a plan. Amen. So I think we're going to survive this and find out what God has for us. And they wound up having um, one of the great judges of Israel, who we know as Samson. Sadly, we're often caught up in his escapades. He had a uh, quite an intense sex drive, it appears. He liked girls a lot, uh, and got himself in trouble a lot, loved to fight. Um, but God used him. And uh, it's, it's interesting, because God picks pe- interesting people to do interesting things. I saw, I saw an inter- a poll yesterday. And the poll, among all the candidates that are running for office, uh, who's, the, who's the most famous candidate in this poll? And it's funny because uh, the overwhelming winner of who's, who's the most... Po- oh, that's the, that was the question. Who's the most, poli- most popular politician uh, that comes to your mind? And, uh, and it was Trump. And it's like... <laughs> Trump. I mean, when's the last time you heard from him? Has he been canceled from everything? Right? He can't tweet. He can't nothing. And, and, but look what God did with him. Uh, and you never, you know, listen, you might have had Trump, you might, you might have worked for Donald Trump because he was a, obviously he is a tremendous businessman. Uh, you, you might want to have gone into business with him because you're going to make a lot of money. Um, but who would have picked him out of the crowd to say, you know what, during your presidency, you're going to cause these things to happen in the world. Uh, and you're also going to be one who that, that winds up defending the unborn child in America like no previous president. And who would have thought of that? You didn't see that coming. I didn't see it coming. So God uses strange, interesting people. And so I hope you and I qualify to be used by God. Of course, this one you would expect. And he's a, he's a mentor to any young, young man uh, or young people, period. And that's Daniel. You had to study, you had to do a, a biographical study on Daniel, who he was, where he was born, how old was he, why, why Daniel? And Daniel had such a close relationship with God that God revealed to him secrets that were written down in the book of Daniel that would come into play, the Bible says, in the last days. God told Daniel, after I've given you all these 12 chapters, you can just seal up the book, Daniel, because nobody's going to understand a word about it until the end of time, and then people will know. And now the book of Daniel is the key to understanding end times prophecy. What about Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 6 tells us that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train or his glory filled the temple. And when the temple was filled, it was filled with the glory of God, the smoke or the glory of God, the, the, the Shekinah glory of God. And, the, and the, the seraphim fell down and bowed and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And, the, and Isaiah said, when I saw that, the temple, the, the pillars of the temple were shaking at the presence of God. And Isaiah fell on his face and he says, woe is me. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And at that, he saw the angel move swiftly to the altar of God, and with tongs, picks up a coal from off the altar, burning coal, glowing hot. And Isaiah stands there, and that angel comes over and places the burning coal on his tongue. And the angel says, Behold, thine... Sins are forgiven and thine iniquity is taken away from you. And from that moment on, Isaiah was commissioned by God and he's known as the evangelical prophet of the Old Testament. There are more quotes of the book of Isaiah in the New Testament than any other book of the Bible. And there's more of Isaiah quoted in the four gospels than any other book of the Bible. Remarkable encounter with God. What about the man Ezekiel? Ezekiel, um, 
I don't even know how to, Ezekiel's encounters with God puzzles people to this day. We still don't get it. I could, we could go through the book of Ezekiel right now and we're describing his encounter with God and you'd all leave, we'd all leave confused. Not confused because, we, because God wants us confused. It's confused because our imagination can't go that far. When, when, when some sort of an angel appears, you know, there's many types of angels. Are you guys with me? Yes. I need some encouragement here. See, make sure you're breathing. When there are angels of different ranks and different orders, there's, there's angels. Um, there are cherubim, there are seraphim. There are various angels and they have various functions. And uh, archangels, that's one of them. But this one particular type of angel that uh, Ezekiel sees he, sees, he sees, he sees them having wings. He said, what's wrong with that? I, wing, you know, it's cute. The, the Bible says that in, instead of feathers, the wings are covered in eyes. I, like eyeball, not the letter I, <laughs> eyes. Now you sit on that for a moment. You, you just ponder that. This this thing comes flying up with a zillion eyes on it. Okay, I went out. <laughs> Think of it. And then another one, these seraphim that stand before the throne of God, they have six wings, three sets, six. The Bible says that they use them, but when they come into the presence of God, they take one set of wings and they cover their body before they come into the presence of God. Imagine that. They cover their body. They're going into the presence of God. And then they take the other two sets of wings and they cover their face in the presence of God. And with the two remaining wings, they fly in his presence. And here's, here's a kicker. They, they each have one head, but four faces They have a face on each side of their heads. And each of the four faces are literally the announcement of the four gospels. I've, I'm, I haven't even touched my notes yet. This is absolutely, let's just, let's just, let's just we'll, we'll do this next time. We'll just, let's just keep going on this. Uh, okay. We'll just. Um, and let's pray for mercy right now. Lord, we pray, we pray right now, even tonight, that before this service is over, a decision would be made for Jesus, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, this is most certainly the strangest introduction to one of our studies ever. But Lord, you're in this, I can tell. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. So these these these. Beans are before the Lord with four faces, and the Bible tells us that one of their faces is the face of a man, a human, res resembles a human. It's a man. When he saw it, when the prophets of old saw, and when John in the book of Revelation saw these beans, there's a face of a man on one part of that head. And on the other side, there's a face of an ox. And on the other side, there's a face of an eagle. Eagle. Think of an eagle right now. The face of an eagle. An eagle, no matter what, an eagle is terrifying to look at face to face. Have you ever looked at an eagle? you ever gone to the zoo? You ever been somewhere where there's an eagle? It's intimidating. They look at you, go, you ought to check it out, just like Google, not now, later. Google an image of a bald eagle and look right at it. When it's looking at you, you kind of feel like, um, <laughs> I mean, it just stares you down. It's, it's absolutely insane. It's so intense. And the Bible says that one of those angels' faces is an eagle. And on the other side, the remaining side, is the face of a lion. How does this look? We're gonna, by the way, you're gonna, Christian, you're gonna see these. You, 
listen, I'm, don't, I know, don't worry, listen, your 401, 401k, I know it's gone, Our, mine's gone too, we don't need it, where we're going, you can't spend it there. <laughs> We've got John 3.16. We don't need a 401. So here's what's cool about it. Um, Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel is written to the Jewish people. I don't know if you know that or not. And by the way, the best of Matthew's gospel is yet to come. You want to know why? The Jewish people who read Matthew's gospel today, they'll read it in secret because they're not, they're not allowed to read it. I don't know if you know they're not. They're not allowed to read it. The rabbis say you can't read it. Yeah, but the guy's name is Matthew Levi. He's a Jew. <laughs> Matthew Levy. That's his name. Did you know that? Yes. You can't read him. No read. <laughs> if, that's why the genealogies are in Matthew the way that they are. Only a Jew appreciates those genealogies. Because to them, they make perfect sense. You know when you read it and you're, it just, you're a Gentile like me and you're like going, Oy vey. <laughs> this guy beget that guy and this guy and those names. And it's like, what is this? Listen, if you're Jewish, you're like going, Oh my, oh my. <laughs> Matthew presents Jesus Christ as King. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is called king of the Jews. And a lion, he's also referred to in Matthew as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Lion, the lion face on the, on the angel. And in Luke's gospel, I think you'll get this one rather quickly. Luke is the only Gentile writer of the of the four Gospels. Luke was a Gentile. A lot of people believe that there's other contributors to the Gospel of Luke. I don't think so. Uh, I think Luke is writing uh, exactly, uh, Luke's the one in the writing. He's wrote the book of Acts in your Bible, and he wrote the book of Luke. And um, Luke is a physician. You know, in those days, physicians, how'd you like to have this come back? <laughs> Doctors, medical doctors, were the slaves of rich people. Now, you, think about that. If you weren't rich, you probably, I don't know if there was like, you went to Kaiser or what back in those days, but <laughs> rich people had their own doctors. And Luke was some rich guy's doctor who gave, or not gave, but loaned or commissioned Luke to travel with Paul because Paul had so many health problems in the Bible. And Luke was always with Paul. And Luke is the one who calls Jesus the son of man. Luke's the gospel that represents Jesus to us as man, the perfect man. And so you look at the lion representing the kingdom, Matthew, you look at Luke, the man's face, the son of man, what's left? What's next? Matthew, Mark, Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, Mark, Luke is the man, so opposing sides. Mark is the shortest gospel with the most miracles recorded. And Jesus is the doer in Mark's gospel. He's always doing something. He's always doing something. And what is it that he's doing? He's raising the dead. He's opening the eyes of the blind. He's cleansing the lepers. He's healing of the sick. He's doing all of these things. Are you hearing me? Yes. And Jesus is servant. He's the servant of the Lord in Mark's gospel. The servant of the Lord. Thus, the ox. The ox was the beast or the animal of burden, of doing. And then there's one left, and that's John. And John's entire message from cover to cover in the Gospel of John is that Jesus is God. He's deity. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. And so with that, throughout the Old Testament, when God says, I'm going to come, I'm going to rescue you, don't, don't give up. Um, if you get weary, I will come and bear you up on eagle's wings. And the face of this angel is one of an eagle's face. The representation of the presence of God in heaven. And so these incredible manifestations. One more I have written down, and that is someone we don't often talk about. I, I, I kind of think we uh, do this in injustice a little, or do her in injustice because we, we have the pendulum swing so far the other way. Uh, if we've escaped Catholicism, we don't often mention Mary because Mary is over, overemphasized in Catholicism. But uh, we Protestants have a tendency to neglect her because we don't want to get anywhere near Mary worship. Uh, and that is certainly prevalent in what is uh, Catholicism and extremely twisted in Romanism. If you know anything about Romanism, uh, there, I, don't know the, I don't know the circle. There's a roundabout in Rome or uh, near the city center of Rome and it's got Jesus crucified on one side of the cross and Mary's crucified on the other side of the cross and it says that she is our co-redeemer. Well, that's not true. In fact, Mary said herself that she was a sinner. Did you know that? Mary announced in, in the Magnificat, Mary calls Jesus her savior. Interesting, right? Mary's the one that the angel appears to her and says, blessed are you, Mary, among all women, for you have found favor in the sight of God. And the announcement is made that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, which is an amazing statement. And by the way, I, I, I'm, I don't even know if I should bring this up. I don't want to give it even any credence, but you guys live in, in the world of insanity. You need to know this. There's a movement right now in some religious groups. I think they're insane. And in, in this movement, uh, they are trying to justify their view of genderism based upon the fact that Jesus didn't have an earthly father. So because he didn't have an earthly father, Jesus was gender neutral. That's, <laughs> that's blasphemous because if you like it or not, the Holy Spirit reveals himself as being in the male or man gender. Now, God announces that to us because he's relating to us. Remember, God is spirit, but he refers to himself as a he. We think in our little finite line that we're living on, and we think, oh, how chauvinistic is that? We don't even know what we're talking about. And, and, and if, you, if that bothers you, this ought to send you out, out of the building on fire. <laughs> Listen to this. Where did women come from? You guys should know this. I'm gonna, okay, let's rewind. We'll edit it for radio. Where did, where, did a, where did a woman come from? From a man. Can men have babies? No. That's not how it happens. God created Adam, and God took from Adam the actual DNA and God made his Holy Spirit watch this tweak because he is the scientist. Amen. He is the engineer Amen. and made a woman out of man. Amen. This is amazing. So watch what happens. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God, the angel announces the Spirit of God will overshadow you. So what, 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 what's going on is this. Mary, having her human blood, right? Of course, she's a human. And in the lineage of Luke's gospel, Mary, her line is listed. And Joseph, Joseph's line is listed in Matthew's gospel. But the problem with Joseph is that he's from the tribe they're both children of David. Do you understand? Both Joseph and Mary. 
But as you break down the genealogies, we got a problem because on Joseph's side of the bloodline, way back in Israel's history, a guy, a king by the name of Jeconiah sinned against the Lord and God's judgment was no one from your DNA. He didn't say DNA, but I'm going to use DNA because that's what we're talking about. Nobody from your descendants, nobody from your DNA, nobody with your blood, Jeconiah, will prosper or fulfill the prophetic line. Your line's condemned. Well, guess what? Joseph was from that line. Joseph had legal rights to the throne by paper, but his line was cursed through Jeconiah. Mary, her line is not cursed and She's a blood relation. Joseph was legal. Mary was blood. So you think God has a problem? God has no problem. Because the plan from eternity was that the son of God would be the son of God and not the son of Joseph. Amen. You never find, except when Jesus is being criticized and attacked, where they're implying that he's the son of Joseph. Think about it. Jesus, when you know, when the Bible refers to Jesus, it will say, Jesus, the son of, have mercy on us, Jesus, son of David. David. Interesting, right? See how that comes together? The legal and the blood, she represents the bloodline, so in her was human blood, right? Her human blood, the Holy Spirit uses in the conception of the son of God, and Jesus' creation is by the Holy Spirit, and it flirts with the idea that in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says the Spirit of God brooded over the waters of the earth. Remember that in creation? The Holy Spirit was moving over the waters. We get the word hover over the waters, because we, we have a hard time with that Hebrew word. The best that we can do is that the Spirit of God at creation was hovering over the waters of of the deep on earth. And the Holy Spirit in this conception of the Son of God, imagine Mary when the angel told her, you're going to be pregnant. And you know what she says? She says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And translation uh, that's not the way, it's not, it's not going to happen the normal way. <laughs> it's going to happen God's way. Amen. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Sounds like a plan, right? Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Amen. What a precious verse. And so the promised prophecies had arrived in Jesus. The incarnation of God appeared in Jesus. While the law was in effect, in other words, the, the gospel had not yet arrived. The gospel, so to speak, allow me to say it this way, had not yet been born. While Israel was under the occupation of Rome, and he comes granting unalienable rights to anyone who would believe by adoption. Think of that. As a believer, when you and I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're adopted into the family of God and you are immediately granted what our forefathers understood to be unalienable rights. That's a, that's a very beautiful colonial way of saying transcendent rights. Rights that have come from God. Is that awesome? I love that. I, I absolutely love that. They recognize that there's certain things that we can do regarding laws and certain things we can't do with laws. And the first thing that we need to do is recognize that God is God and we're not. Amen. And that, that God is king. Right now I'm going through this, um, I'm doing this thing right now regarding the, the origins of America. And you're quite, you, you'd quite, I think you'd be shocked if you found out that the origins of America... Uh, started 
in the mind and in the writings and in the preaching of a couple of guys. Uh, if you've ever heard of John Huss, John Huss and John Wycliffe. You ever heard of those guys? They were preachers in England and in Germany. And those were the founding fathers of Martin Luther's Reformation. But everything that they were talking about had everything to do with God being the king. The king's not the king. The king, they said, is subservient to the king of kings. If you're the king of England, you're only the king of England. God is king of kings. That's what they said. And they got, listen, they were burned at the stake for saying it. They said all human government bows to the authority of Christ. And they were killed for that. Absolutely amazing. I have to give you one more verse just to say that we did have a Bible study. <laughs> it's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It ties into everything we've been talking about. And I love this passage of scripture. And you guys, if, you know, if you've been here for a while, you know that there's one word that drives me crazy with excitement and imagination. And I'll point it out in a moment. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, and without controversy. Boy, that, that statement right there is amazing. In other words, uh, cry and moan and gripe all you want. It doesn't matter. Your philosophies and your, your imaginations and beliefs and your contrary religions and whatever you want to concoct is uh, just hot air. Why? Without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. Watch this. So now he's going to tell you what it is. God was manifested in the flesh. Stop right there. How many words is that? One, two, three, four, five, six words. Six words. Six words. Those, those are stumpers. God was manifested in the flesh. Just look, everyone look at that. God. God. Elohim. Singular God. El. God. Him, plural, singular, plural. We got a problem on our hands. And a Jew will say to you tonight, no, you don't. That's him. We know who that is. That's Elohim. And we say, okay, but I am at the end of El, Elohim, is plural. Yes, yes, it's plural. A cherub is an angel. Cherubim, I am, are multiple angels. In Hebrew, I am is a multiple version of what you're talking about. Are you hearing me? So listen, we're Christians. There's one God. There's not two gods. There's not three gods. There's one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. One God. How can we have a one God and in his very announcement of his name is a plurality. Isn't that something? So what we need to do from the ancient Hebrew scriptures forward is read the Bible with what Genesis tells us about is that we're dealing with a single God who in somehow, we're going to have to keep researching because as we read through Genesis and then Exodus, as we read through the Bible, we got to keep looking for this uh, this answer because it's weird and then we wind up seeing very quick and short order as I mentioned a moment ago the spirit of God was there at creation now you've got a manifestation where you've got God who is singular but a, an, a distinct person being addressed in scripture as the spirit of God. The Bible says Israel disobeyed God and made angry his Holy Spirit and he turned on them and became their enemy. The Bible announces that in the Old Testament, the Bible says, I will be unto him as a father and he shall be unto me as a son. And in Psalm 2, the Bible says, that the God of heaven will laugh at the calamity of man who has rejected God. He'll look down from heaven and see all of man's ridiculous attempts to live life without God, and he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. And the Bible, the Bible tells us there, in the same psalm, 
It says, but you should turn and kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and smite you in the way. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God manifests himself in this plurality. All in that one little statement right there, those six words are serious because Islam cannot say that. Mormonism cannot say that. Buddhism cannot say that. Name it. Jehovah Witnesses cannot say that. You need to know this. They'll tell you something different at the door. God was revealed, manifested, made skin. You have to ask yourself, when did that happen? Next, justified in the spirit. What does that mean? It means everything that God did in the skin, in flesh, was approved of by the Holy Spirit. It means that whoever this God is who came or became flesh did everything by the power of the Spirit of God. And without the Spirit of God, he would do nothing. Seen by angels. This is the word seen. We get the word gawk. It means your jaw falls open. Oh. It means to be wide-eyed and open-mouthed. <gasps> Watch. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, and <gasps> by angels. <laughs> when, what's the big deal? I thought angels always saw him. Apparently not. Apparently not. Certainly this is true. If you're dissecting this verse, the wow factor or the aha moment is the fact that God was manifested in the flesh and that caused the angels to freak. When Jesus was being born from Mary, can you imagine? In the spirit realm, she might have been, like she would have been, any uh, Hebrew girl, she would have been either sit, uh, uh, um, standing on two uh, rocks or two uh, stools like they would use for milking, two stools. They would sit and squat or they would often, they would grab a, a they would do, do baby births upright. So now step into the spiritual scene, into the invisible scene, where the angels are at. This first leads you to believe that the angels were watching what's going on here. Um, so our, our creator is about ready to come into this messed up, wretch hole of a planet to rescue these things? And he's going he's gonna to come out like one of them? Is that the deal? Is that the plan? That's the plan, right? That's the plan? Can you imagine when it starts happening? Can you imagine? I'm making this part up right now. Everything has been true up until this moment. Can you imagine what if an angel's looking and, and one angel says, I, I see, I, I, he's got black hair. I think it's black hair. <laughs> Here comes, I can see his head. Look, he's got, this is God. He, he's, got, he's got ears just like they have ears. <laughs> he's starting to cry. He's coming out. Look, he's coming out. He's much faster now. He's coming out and this is, this is him. This is our maker. This is our creator. This is, he's the one. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians and the book of Hebrews that it's Jesus Christ who is the creator of all things. And without him, nothing was created that was created. No wonder why those angels gawked, right? No wonder why they freaked out. Preached among the Gentiles. Who, <laughs> this is a, a pure fact. There's no message that's been preached more around the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not a one. Nothing even comes close. Believed on in the world. And did he not return? Received up into glory. Wow. So precious. You guys, um, we're going to end right now and, and let's... Let's just do this. Let's bow. Let's, you want to bow? Yes. You want, can you get on your knees where you're at? Yes. Can, you, can you do that? Let's do that. 
Hey, I'm going to have Armin. Armin, come on out and lead us in. You guys want to dim the lights so nobody can be detected as how difficult it is for us to bow? <laughs> Armin, Armin, Armin. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, let's dim the lights. Way too, yeah, you can dim these too. Um, let's do this, church. We have a lot to pray for. Number one, as we pray, let's be thankful to God for who he is, that he loves you. Our nation's in trouble. Our nation needs light. Okay, we, need, we want to pray for God's will to be done in our country. Sad news tonight out of San Francisco. I forget the number. It's well over 50% of people in San Francisco have said that they're going to be leaving San Francisco because of the violence and because of their fears. San Francisco will become a ghost town, ladies and gentlemen, the first mega metropolitan center that is scheduled to evaporate on the planet Earth, so to speak, as there's going to be a mass evacuation. Church family, our nation's hurting. And our land is lawless. And our churches are lost. And so many people are playing with their life. They're playing, I like to look at it this way, they're playing marbles with diamonds. And they don't even know it. Armin's going to lead us in a song. Can we make it a prayer of ours? Can we do that? As we kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. Spirit of the living God, Spirit, tonight we yield to you completely to hover over us, as it were, to brood over us, Lord. Be our covering, be our protection.
be our power, all for this and all to this end, that Jesus Christ might be glorified in our lives. Lord, we are a happy people. We are a glad people because your word reveals to us how much you love us, that you, you bought our salvation not by turning Jupiter into gold or Saturn into silver. You could have done that. You could have, you could have spoken the moon and caused it to become platinum. And you could have paid in some way, shape, or form however you would establish in your economy our debt but even if you would have done those things clearly, it wouldn't have been enough. You do not delight in silver or gold. We thank you, Lord, tonight that we are a people who will be leaving this building in a moment to say and to know, I am a blood-bought child of the living God. And so because that's true, we do not hide we do not cower back. We are not timid. We're not just waiting it out. We have been activated by the Holy Spirit to shine the light of your truth into every nook and cranny, every hole, every canyon, every closet the light of God, the love of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Lord, when we get up off our knees tonight, may there be a renewed power upon every single one of us. And Lord, for those that are here tonight that have never experienced the filling and the anointing power that comes upon the believer, we pray tonight, Lord, that they would go from this place and seemingly nothing happens at all. They're wondering, what was that all about? And tomorrow, tonight, Friday, something supernatural will transpire in their lives and they'll know this is the hand of God. This is the power of Jesus. Lord, I remember the first day you did that in my life and I thank you, Lord, that it's never stopped. Yeah. I should... I should say, you've never stopped, not it. <laughs> so Lord, tonight, may your people know your power. And Father, as they go their way, may they be kings and priests of this glorious gospel to take the word into their world, into their office, into the school, onto the site, at home. And so Lord, we yield to you now. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb.